Now, if you've been here a minute, you'll know that I love making bullet journal idea videos. My bullet journal ideas playlist has over a hundred videos in it currently, and that doesn't actually include the 80 something monthly setups that I've done. Quite a bingeable backlog. But today we're going to have a look at some of the collections of bullet journal ideas that could be really useful for your journal. This is going to be a long one, so get yourself comfortable, grab a pen and a paper to jot down any ideas that resonate with you as we go through, and let's have a look at what we've got. We'll start with one of the most requested topics, which is weekly logs, and I've got 12 ideas for you there. This includes one-page weeklies, vertical, horizontal, and dutch doors. Starting with our one-page weekly layouts, of which we have three different ideas, the first one just takes your page and divides it into eight sections, so one for each day of the week and then an additional space for whatever you'd like. I've put a habit tracker in here, but this could be a mood tracker, a weather tracker, a short priorities list, whatever you need to use it for. In terms of the spacing, you can see a picture of that here, and I'm going to be giving you one of these pictures for each of the layouts that we have in this video. All of these layouts were set up in my A5 Archer and Olive notebook, which is 13 centimeters or 26 grid spaces across, and 19 centimeters or 38 grid spaces down. So if you're setting these layouts up in a different notebook, just keep in mind that you might need to do some tweaking. This one is nice and simple, but flipping over we have another nice and super simple one page weekly. This one is based on a two column system. So one column where you have a section for each day of the week, maybe for a meal plan or an events list, something like that, and then a running task list down the other side. At the top you could put a header to describe which week this is for, or you could use it as decoration or for a small quote. Again, all of these different sections are interchangeable with other things. In terms of the spacing for this layout and the next one, you can see that on the screen here. These diagrams were all made in my Excel bullet journal spread planner, which is a perk that I give to my patrons. Theirs comes blank, but they can use it to plan out their different spreads. The layout idea we have on the other side of the spread is a 3x3, three three, so 3 boxes across and 3 boxes down, giving us a total of 9 spaces, so 7 for each of the days of the week, one that I've dedicated to a mini calendar and a top tasks list, and the other one down the bottom we have a habit tracker in. As you can see, the space to write in the habit is only one box across, so on this one I've used icons to represent the habits. What if you need a little bit more space though? Maybe your one page weekly isn't really for you. Well then, in the next ones we do have double page or full spread weeklies. This one is loosely based on the idea of having six sections per page. So one, two, three, four, five, six. But as you can see, these two have been combined to make a larger section for the habit tracker. Similar idea on the other side, except this combination is for a note space. This leaves us eight other boxes, so one for each day of the week, and then one for top tasks, mini calendar, whatever you want to use it for. In terms of the sizing of that one, you can see that on the screen here. The numbers down the side and along the top represent the grid spacings rather than the grid dots. And I've tried to keep the coloration fairly similar so you can see how the schematic relates to the actual layout. Flipping over, we have another vertical style weekly. I consider vertical style to be any kind of layout where the length of the boxes is larger than the width of the boxes. For this one though, we have split each of the pages into four sections. So, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This gives us eight spaces, one for each day of the week, and then also that extra space to do with as you will. Here you can see the spacings for that layout, and you'll also have seen that the header spaces for each of the boxes is actually a little bit narrower than the writing box itself. This is just a nice and easy way to make your spread look a little bit more decorative, and I've tried to be fairly minimal with the decoration on these layouts, mainly so you can actually see the structure of the layout, but you can really make them your own by changing the color palettes, adding more doodles or decorative elements, changing the fonts or lettering, all of that kind of stuff. Flipping over though, we have another vertical layout. This one is based on the idea of a school timetable, to be completely honest. This is a layout that I used to use because I had six periods in a day, but you could of course use these for different things as well. So you might want to batch your tasks together. For instance, things that I need to do at home, things that I need to do at the office, things that I need to do when I'm out and about. Because school for me only ran from Monday to Friday, that is what I've got for the Monday to Friday sections, but Saturday and Sunday are tucked on the side here. And we've also got an additional note section down the bottom. The spacing on this one can be a little bit tricky if you're doing it for the first time, so do make sure to have a look at this picture carefully if you wanted to set it up for yourself. 
You can of course take screenshots or save the video for later if you wanted to come back to this one and recreate these layouts. My personal preference is for vertical style layouts, but maybe you prefer horizontal ones. In that case, we have three ideas for that as well, the first one being this one here. This one is based on the idea of taking the page and cutting it into four sections going across, so one, two, three, four, and the same on the other side. And then I've also taken each of those sections and included a header space, a place to write down tasks or notes, and then a place to write down events for each day. How you actually use any of those spaces is up to you. Maybe instead of events, you might want to have a journaling space or a place to draw on a doodle for the weather for each day, a place to track your habits on a daily basis, whatever you need it for. The spacing on this one is nice and simple, but remember if you do have a different size journal to me, so not 26 boxes across and 38 boxes down, you will have to do some tweaking to make sure that you get it all evenly spaced. Flipping on over to another horizontal layout, this one has the kind of horizontal section on the left hand side here, so Monday through Sunday running down the page. As part of that we also have two separate sections for each of them, so a place to write events and a place to write notes. And then the page on the right here is sectioned off into four different spaces, so home tasks, personal tasks, work tasks and other tasks. Looking at the spacing of that one, you can of course change any of these category labels to be something that suits you. And we also have an additional row of space at the top left of the spread. That could be used for a header or it could be used for decoration. In fact, you could make all of the boxes on the right hand page a little bit smaller if you wanted to include even more decorative elements. Do remember, all of these are ideas and I want you to take them and tweak them to fit the way that you like to do your planning. Flipping over though, and we have another horizontal layout, but this one has the daily boxes in the middle of the page. So we have roughly a third of the page down each of the sides in each case, so a third of this page and a third of that page. And then we have the remaining two thirds for that space in the middle. Because I want to buy boxes even, I have combined the weekend into one box, but you could of course have three on this side and four on that side or vice versa if you wanted to have a separate box for each of the days of the week. Having a look at the spacing of that one, you can see that the places on the sides of the page I've got four of. So on the right hand side, I've just put this down as a task list. And then on the left hand side, we have the mini calendar, a place for like priorities or must do tasks, and then a small habit tracker, again using those icons. Maybe though a single spread still isn't enough space for you. Totally fair. And in that case, we could use a Dutch door layout. So Dutch door layouts typically require you to either cut your page like we have here, or what you can use are tip-ins, which I'll show you in a bit. As you can see from the spacing here, the section in black is the place that we've cut away. And because this is a Dutch door layout, you're actually gonna end up using two full spreads to do it. So this is side A's spacing, but then you can see here, we also have side B's spacing. So the next spread in the notebook. Again, that large black section on the left is the space that you'll have cut away to set up the layout. Having a look at the physical layout though, you can see that we have split each of the pages kind of into four sections. So one, two, three, four, one, two, and then the space that's over here would have been three and four. So we have a space for each day of the week from Monday through Friday. And then if we flip over, we have Saturday and Sunday on the other side. On the underside of the Dutch door, we've combined two of those spaces to make one large space for a to-do list. And then again, combined the two spaces that would have been on this side to make a meal plan section. Dutch doors can be a little bit daunting though, but I found that this type of Dutch door, where you're cutting away from the side of your journal, this is what I call a vertical Dutch door because this part is longer than it is wide. These ones are a little bit more approachable because you don't need to bring scissors near the spine of your notebook which can be a little bit scary. Moving into the scary territory though, we of course have a layout that does have a horizontal Dutch door. So you can see on this one, we've cut away the top of the page so that we just have this part in the middle, which covers the bottom. Again, this one is loosely based on the idea of taking each page and splitting it into four sections. So you can see we have a section for each of the days from Monday through Thursday. And then when we flip the Dutch door over, we have Friday through Sunday and also a note space. At the top section though, because this is the part that you'll actually be able to see regardless of which way you flip the Dutch door, we have a projects list or maybe like a top priorities, top tasks for the week kind of space, a habit tracker with a little space to write down each of those habits, and then a space on the left hand side which has the initials for each of the days of the week 
and really you could put anything in here. It could be a meal planner, it could be an event space, it could be a place to write out one line a day or some kind of like memory keeping stuff whole bunch of ideas and I do actually have a separate video that you might want to check out on things that you can include in your weekly spreads. As we look at the spacing for this one here though, remember that you do need to be careful if you're cutting away the top side of any page in your journal. If you're bringing scissors near the center of your notebook, can be a little scary, do need to make sure we're being careful. So this one is side A and then of course we do have side B or the second spread of the Dutch door layout. Again, anything in black is the part that we've cut away. I do of course have a playlist of different Dutch door layout ideas if that's something in particular you want to explore and that one's linked in the description box below. As we said, taking scissors to your journal can be a little bit daunting, kind of scary, and we also have the top section of this page that we don't want to waste. So what you can do to set up Dutch doors is use that section to just tip in another piece of paper. So by tip in I effectively just mean stick in. So this is what that cutaway paper ended up becoming. It's effectively a little Dutch door layout, but you didn't have to cut the page itself. Having a look at the spacing of that layout, this one's a little bit special because we're not cutting away any of the page itself, but we do have to allow a space to tip in the tip in. So you can see the gray box here is where that tape would be attached. We then also need to look at the spacing for the tip-in itself, and you can see we've got space down the side of each side of that tip-in so that we can attach the tape to that as well. Again, you can screenshot any of the layout ideas we've had, either in their, you know, physically presented form or the schematic pictures, if you wanted to recreate them for yourself. But for this one, you can see we have a small to-do list down the side. I say small in the sense of narrow, not in the sense of long, because it's plenty long enough. We also have a habit tracker at the top, our tip-in has a gratitude space and a space to outline any kind of challenges for the week. You can think of those as being on the underside of the tip-in because they might be a little bit more personal, including your memories for the week. We have a column for a meal plan or a meal log, depending on how you want to use it, and also a space for notes. So this one doesn't have any daily boxes, but you could of course change any parts of these layouts to actually include those if you wanted to. One of the parts that people found particularly helpful in that idea lineup were the kind of snapshots or schematics of each of the different weekly styles. I know it can be a little bit tricky to actually kind of see the dimensions when we're doing this kind of top down view and it might be a little hard to see the dots because of the brightness or whatever. So having those schematics with the numbers along the side, I know people found really helpful for if they wanted to recreate it in their own journal. Outside of schematics, one of the things I try and do in my videos to make kind of recreating the layouts a little bit easier is just kind of framing the journal quite up close. So not having a lot of like wasted space around the outside of the journal. So you can hopefully see the dimensions as well as possible. For our next set of ideas though, a topic that we've started to dabble with more on the channel is that of mental health and more so how this relates to productivity. Like how can we be productive without ruining ourselves to do it? Having layouts in our journals which are designed to help us either maintain or improve our mental health can be really useful, so I've got 12 ideas for you in that space too. The first idea is having a layout related to your self-care routines. Now I've set this one up so that you have a full year at a glance here and you can note down which tasks are happening when. I've also got a space at the bottom for three weekly tasks. So in the space that says weekly task one, you'd write in what the task actually was or the habit that you're trying to build. And then each of these dots represents one of the weeks in the year. You could of course make this one larger to encompass the full spread if you have more things that you want to track. So daily tasks, weekly or fortnightly, monthly, quarterly, and biannual. But for this one, we've just kept it to the one page. Having the year at a glance in particular though can be helpful to making sure that you're keeping on top of those self-care routines throughout the entire of the year. And it's a good visual to show that you're actually focusing on that stuff. The next idea we have is a daily wins or a ta-da list rather than a to-do list. It's essentially set up so that you're focusing more on positive things. What did I accomplish rather than focusing on the stuff that I didn't get done? I've set this one up as kind of like a line a day, so we've just got the numbers 1 through 31 running down the side of the page. But you could set this one up as a calendar view or something else. Of course, all these layouts are just ideas. Flipping over though, and the next idea we have is that of a mental health habit tracker. So habits related to improving or maintaining your mental health. 
I've again set this one up in the vertical view. So we have little icons to represent each of those healthy habits. So maybe it's waking up with the sun, brushing our teeth, taking medication, whether or not we had a good energy day, etc. A tracker that you can set up in a similar way is that of a work boundaries tracker. Establishing and sticking by our boundaries can be a very good way to support our mental health. So some of the boundaries we have here are starting work on time, making sure that you're honoring your lunch break, making sure that you're taking other breaks throughout the day, and so on. I think this one in particular is something that I need to set up in my next journal. When it comes to safeguarding our mental health, one of the things you might want to think about is the circle of control, or in particular, things that are within your control versus the things that are outside of your control. A lot of mental pain can come from trying to control things that we do not have control over. So getting clear on where that boundary is could be really helpful. I've set this one up to actually be a zone of control. So you at the center, these are the things you control, and then those are the things outside of that zone or you could just set it up as a list. Talking about lists, one that could be very helpful is that of a trigger list. So this is something that helps trigger your brain dumping process. So different things that you can consider when you're doing your brain dump to make sure that you capture everything you want to. You can find really good references online if you look up the word trigger list ideas or trigger list reference and just jump into the Google image space. Flipping over, and the next idea we have is that of a mood boosters reference. And I've set this one up to be in terms of time. So five minute tasks you can do, 10 minute, 20 minute. Having them broken down by time can just be helpful so that when you have that amount of time spare, or if you only have that amount of time to give to trying to boost your mood, you can look at the relevant list. You might wanna break this down into different styles though. So mood boosters that are related to being outside, mood boosters that are related to food and drink, something like that. But I find a themed list is helpful. The idea we have under this one is that of a favorite things day plan. So one day where you cram in all of your favorite things or as many as you can. I've set this one up kind of like a timeline. So sleeping in, having Mac as breakfast, getting in some reading time, etc. Of course, your favorite things are individual to you, so make sure that you have a good think about the stuff that you would really enjoy putting into your favorite things day. Even better, after you make the day plan, actually schedule a day to have your favorite things day. Underneath this one though, we have the recipe for a good day. So this one isn't necessarily your favorite things, but this is the kind of stuff you can do on a regular day or a special day, just to make that day as good as possible. So trying to start the day right, effectively. The regular day are the ones that you could do pretty much any day, whereas the ultra version or deluxe version are things that you might want to do if you have a little bit of extra time or want to make a day particularly special. I've just set this one up as a checklist so that you could run through it anytime you want to set up a day that's going to be as good as it can be. After this, the next idea we have is that of a compliment keeper, or effectively a little pocket in your journal that you can keep little notes or little compliments from other people. This could be stuff that they actually write down on paper themselves and then you just keep it in your journal. Or you might want to turn emails or other kind of conversations you've had with people into little post-its and keep them in there. It's just a nice go-to place to have kind words from others for when you're feeling a little bit low. The next idea we have is the let it go list or things that you don't want to be bringing forward with you into the future. These could be small things or larger things, but do make sure that they're things that are within your control and things that are reasonable. You can't be like, oh yeah, I'm letting go of doing my laundry. Well, I mean like you could, but you know, make good choices. <laughs> the idea we have at the bottom here though is that of a stressor log or a place to get reflective about happenings or events that trigger certain feelings or responses within you. I've set this one up as a table, so we have a place to write down when it happened, what the trigger was or the happening that occurred to make you feel a certain way, how you felt both emotionally and physically, and then what you did to respond. This could be a kind of response in terms of trying to make yourself feel better or get you back to the kind of neutral state. Or you could write down your kind of knee jerk reaction so that you pay more attention to those kind of things in future. When I went to think up ideas for mental health related layouts, I had way more ideas than 12 though. So we do actually have two other videos on mental health bullet journal ideas if you're on the hunt for more inspiration. Those ones are linked down in the description, along with hopefully every other video that I mention or have mentioned in this video. If anything's missing, just let me know in the comments. 
but make sure you check out those links so you can queue up what you want to watch next. When thinking about mental health though, this often starts to lead into physical health because the two are really closely connected. So as can be expected, for our next lineup of ideas, I have 12 physical health related bullet journal ideas. Remember, as we go through, all of these are ideas just by the name of the page, also the layout of the page, also the decorative elements. So if you're going to be recreating any of these in your journal, it is a good idea to think about how can I tweak this to best suit my needs? And I do encourage you to do that. But let's have a look at those physical health ideas. Our first physical health layout idea is that of a don't break the chain tracker. Essentially, this one is for any kind of habit that you want to build that you're doing on a daily basis. And the idea is that you don't want to skip any days. For this one, I've just set it up as a grid that has 365 spaces. So January 1st is up here because it didn't quite fit into the box. But for each day that you complete the habit, you fill it in with a colored dot. But anytime you break the chain, you have to change the color of pen you're using. So for instance, this person did it on January 1st, January 2nd, third, etc. up until this day where they broke the chain and then they had to use a different color to fill in their next chain. This can help as a good motivator because as your chain gets longer and longer, you don't want to break it. Our next idea is that of a better health mind map. You can see I've mainly used a lot of stickers on this one. I have a lot of physical health related stickers that I just don't use usually. <laughs> But the general idea with this one is that you start with the central idea, so improving your physical health. You then branch out into the different areas of physical health. So the ones I've got are nutrition, hydration, sleep, exercise, hygiene, and avoiding harm. And then from there, you branch out even further to think about the different habits or routines that you could build to support each of those things. These mind maps will look different per person, also depending on what you want to focus on but it can be a good way to take a more holistic approach to your physical health, rather than just focusing on exercise or just focusing on nutrition. The next idea we have is a health-related year in pixels. Now, a lot of the time when you see years in pixels, they're related to moods or mood trackers, but you can also use them for other things. So the idea with this one is that you might use it for types of exercise, where each of the different colored dots represents a different type of exercise. You could also use it for some of the things I've listed here, so volume of water, whether you did or didn't have fast food that day, step counts, hours of sleep, really anything. The way this one is set up is that we have the initials for each of the months of the year along the top, and then the numbers 1 through 31 down the side. Then, because some months are shorter than others, this line at the bottom is kind of jagged because we've got 31 days in January, only 28 in February, 31 in March, and so on. This means that each of the little boxes in here represents a day, and you could just color in that box to represent the happening, depending on what you're tracking. Flipping over, and the next idea we have is a physical care bingo board. Could this be one of my videos without a bingo board? <laughs> Effectively, the way this one works though, is that you set up a grid of whatever size you want, mine's four by four, and then you fill this with physical health tasks, or little goals that you might have related to your physical health. I do encourage you to populate this with things you actually have a control over. So for instance, you have control over how many steps you do in a day, so we've got some of those in here. But you could of course populate this with milestones if you wanted to, you just have a little bit less control over those typically. As part of your bingo board, you may also want to set up some rewards for yourself. So a reward for the first diagonal, for the first vertical, and for the first horizontal completed. And you could also have a reward related to filling the full board. Down the bottom, the next idea we have are NSVs or non-scale victories, or milestones that aren't related to your weight effectively. These could be things like the changes in clothing sizes, if that's something you want to focus on, any improvements in your energy level or mood, how many new healthy foods you've discovered. As the name suggests, just anything that's related to not the scale. An idea that I personally love is that of monthly challenges. So having a different health related challenge for each of the months of the year. I've set this one up as kind of like a year at a glance. So we have mini calendars for each of the different months. And then rather than writing in the header for the month in terms of its name, it's just what the challenge is. So January is daily walking. February is having water when you wake up. March is getting your active minutes for the day, that kind of stuff. For any of the days that you do complete it, you just color in that day with a marker or a pencil or whatever. And then for the days that you don't, you could cross it out or use a different color. 
Over onto our next spread, and this idea is that of the 500 miles and 500 more. If you know which song I'm referring to, let me know in the comments. But this one is effectively some kind of an exercise log that's based on distance. So that could be walking, it could be running, cycling, swimming. In this one I've set it up so that each of the little boxes represents 10 miles. So 10, 20, 30, over to 100, and then through to 200, through to 300, etc. As you reach that distance, you then just colour in the little box. So this person has done 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, but they haven't quite gotten to 80 yet, so that box hasn't been coloured in. Of course, this one does only go up to 500, so if you wanted your 500 more, you would have to double it. The next idea we have is that of a meals to try space. You can see I have again used stickers on this one, and all of the equipment I've used is linked in the description box below, but we have breakfast ideas, lunch and dinner, and we've also got a little space to note down the number of calories for that meal, if that was something you were interested in. You could also of course just set this one up as a regular list, or you might want to use a picture gallery where you take pictures off the internet from the different recipes and print them out so you've kind of got like a food vision board. We're very visual people when it comes to food, so being able to actually see the picture of the food might make you more inclined to try it out. Speaking about eating, the next idea is that of the Eat the Rainbow Challenge. So it's effectively making yourself a list of foods, hopefully in rainbow order so that it's actually a rainbow, and then trying those out in your meals throughout the year. I've set this one up as just a dot list, but you could put dots in to represent the colours of that food, so for instance red for apple or green depending on the type of apple you're looking at, yellow for banana, or I suppose green depending on the one you're looking at, so on and so forth. After this the next idea we have is a couch to 5k tracker. And if I was going to do a couch to 5k tracker, I probably wouldn't set it up in this way. I'd probably set it up as an actual schedule or grid to show for each week, how many runs do I need to do, which days am I going to do them. But in the interest of giving you guys more ideas, this one's just set up as a regular kind of dot list. So as you do each of those runs in order, you just tick off the little dot next to the descriptor. So this one is a 20 minute run where you're doing one minute of running followed by one and a half minutes of walking repeatedly, and so on and so forth for the rest of them. You can find some very helpful grid layouts of the Couch to 5k tracker online, so if that sounds like something you're curious in, I do encourage you to check it out. After this we have the Physical Health 2323s in 2023, or whichever year you're looking at, so 2424s in 2024, 2525s in 2025. But effectively this is 23 things you want to do 23 times in the year of 2023. I've made all of these physical health related, so things like walking outside, going to gym sessions, like self-led gym sessions, going to gym classes, having sessions with your personal trainer, so on and so forth. I do encourage you that if you're setting one up like this, make sure they're kind of things that you can do 23 times. We want to be realistic in our expectations here, but it can be a bit of fun. Another fun related one is that of the fun healthy stats page. So it's taking regular statistics and turning them into something that's a little bit more quirky. For instance, you might want to do your distances covered converted into pop culture references. So you have completed enough steps to get to Mordor. Things like that. You can of course do this for other statistics as well, so energy values, masses, for instance mass values converted into animals or into food, random fun things. Like hey, you built muscle mass equivalent to a ripe avocado, or something else. While that was just 12 ideas for physical health bullet journal layouts, this is another topic that I have another video on, which is also linked in the description box. So if improving your physical health is one of your current goals, then that might be worth checking out. Speaking of goals, one of the things that I love to share on my channel is goal related content. So whether that be goal setting or goal planning or goal getting, all of it. I love getting to share layouts that will help you be more likely to reach your goals. So that is what our next segment is all about, 12 bullet journal layout ideas for helping you achieve your goals. Our first idea is that of a goal brainstorming page, and up the top here is where my brainstorm was. I know it's fairly pretty, it's kind of neat, but that's because this was a nice new planner and I wanted it to be nice and neat. But starting with a brainstorm before you actually start setting your goals can really help you identify what you might want your goals to be. Working on too many things at once can either lead to burnout or just not making a lot of progress. So I find that starting with a brainstorm to get all of my ideas on paper first will help me then select which ones I actually want to focus on. 
So you can, of course, get messy with it. This one's done in my nice big brainstorming book, and this brainstorm in particular wasn't so much about picking goals, but more about taking my goals and breaking them down into actions. So thinking about, for this goal, what are the different areas that I want to work on, and what does that mean in terms of actually weekly, daily, monthly tasks that I have to get done. It might be messy, but it was super useful. Another page that can be useful to set up before you actually start setting your goals is that of a level 10 life. This one involves taking each of the different categories of your life, and I do encourage you to pick these categories yourself rather than just using mine because your life situation is different to my one, as is everybody's. But taking those categories and rating them out of 10, where 1 is the worst possible score, like complete unhappiness, and 10 is the very best outcome. What I'd also encourage you to do is kind of set up a scale for yourself in terms of like, what does one mean? What does six mean? Just so that you have a little more clarity around assigning those values. I do have a separate video on the level 10 life if you want more information. But on this one, each of the colored bars, I just colored them in because I like rainbows, but they come up to what my rating was at this point in time. So for physical health, I gave myself a rating of three. For mental health, I gave myself a rating of four, so on and so forth. Each of the stars represent what my rating was last time I did this, because I like to do a level 10 life check-in with each new journal. So last time I rated it, I gave physical health a two. This time it went up to a three. Last time I rated my personal development at a three, but this time it had gone up to a 5. Of course, you can also go down in ratings, but it helps to see if you're kind of tending in the right direction. You can also then use your level 10 life to inform what you might want your goals to be. So anything that's the lowest rated section, maybe those are the things that you want to focus on. A fun layout that you can use for your goals is that of a bingo board. I know mine says self-care because it was mainly related to self-care tasks, but you could also just populate this with your goals for the year or for the season, month, etc. The nice part about this kind of layout is that you can also set it up so that you have rewards for certain amounts of completion. So your first horizontal, your first vertical, or your first diagonal completed, and then the full board as a whole. When I do bingo boards, I like to set them up with little doodles and pictures just to make them look a little bit more fun, but you could just write in what your goals are too. Another way to make your goals fun is a 23 in 2023 list. So 23 goals that you want to complete in the year of 2023. Of course, if you're not setting up your journal for 2023, then 24 and 24, 25 and 25, so on and so forth. And just remember, these don't have to be big things. They can be smaller things or a combination of big and small things, but essentially 23 things that you want to get done in the year of 2023. I just set this one up so that we have a little checkbox for each of the 23 things. So the thing could be written beside this box and then ticked off once it's been completed. A similar idea to this one is 23 23s in 2023, where you have 23 things that you want to do 23 times in the year. For these ones, I do encourage you to make them small things, so just really consider what you could realistically do 23 times. So for me, that's things like 23 movies watched, 23 TV show seasons watched, 23 new artists listened to. Along with this section here, where I can effectively track my progress in graphical form, so just filling in a little box as I complete each of those individual times, I then also have a place to list out the details of that. So for those 23 movies I watched, what were the movies? I can write the titles in here. Same idea with TV shows. For the new artists listened to, I can write down the artist name. So I've got little pages after this one to write down the details. For some of them, I'm writing down a little bit more, so I've got two columns to write that stuff in. But for some of them, I'm going to be taking down less information. So maybe just like a date or something like that. So for 20 minute workouts, I don't need to write out what type of workout I did. I just wanted to note that it got done. So I want to write out what date it happened. Having that space to write that extra information just means that when it comes to filling out my graphical part, I'm more likely to not stuff it up. More likely to not accidentally record things twice. Plus I appreciate having that extra info. Still thinking about getting things done, another idea we have for a goal-related layout is that of the 101 things list, or 101 things that you want to get done in the year. 
Now, I know 101 things sounds like a lot, and I mean, technically, in a way, it kind of is, but I really enjoy this list just as a way to have all of these little things that I want to get done in one place so that if I have a little bit of extra time, maybe a spare afternoon or a weekend or whatnot, I can refer back to this list and find one of those little things that I wanted to do and actually get it done. You can see from the black boxes, I did not get the entire list done. I really don't push myself to 100% my 101 things list, but there are still some really fun things on here that I did get done and a nice good memories for me. So stuff like celebrating my 30th birthday or upgrading my editing software or going to the food expo, getting a filling on smiley face. They don't necessarily need to be good things, I suppose. <laughs> As I said, I do encourage you to populate it with not just big things, because doing 101 big things in one year, that'd be quite a stretch. Coming back to this page, our seventh idea is that of a goal action plan. I love action plans, they are one of the most useful layouts in my opinion, but it's effectively taking your goal and breaking it down into the steps that you actually need to do in order to get it done. I set this one up so that we have one goal at the top and one goal at the bottom. I've listed out what the why or the reason behind that goal was, and then also broken it down into three focus areas. For each of those focus areas, I have one-off tasks, the ones with the little gray dot, and then I also have repeated actions or the things that I need to do on a monthly, weekly, or daily basis. Those ones would then get put on a monthly action plan, which looks something like this. So the monthly action plan is broken up into those sections that we've talked about before. So the one-off or monthly tasks, the weekly tasks or things I need to do on an every week basis, and then the daily tasks or things that I need to do on an everyday basis. The one-off and monthly tasks, they just get an individual tick box that I can tick off once it's done. The weekly tasks I set up with numbers to represent each of the weeks in that month. So one being the first week, two being the second, so on and so forth. And then the daily tasks get individual habit trackers for each of those, or instead I'll put them on my habit trackers that I put on my weekly spreads or in my monthly setup. Depends on the month. Again though, action plans, super helpful, because this is actually where you're getting stuff done. It's also good to have a place to note down the progress that you're making on your goals, and something like a milestone log could be helpful for that. This one's just set up like a simple list, so header, list of when things happened and what it was that happened. Or you could do these more as memory keeping style pages or really whatever fits to the goals that you've set for yourself. Something that I think is super valuable and possibly a little underrated when it comes to goal setting is that of goal reflection. So at the end of a set period of time, whether that be a week, a month, a quarter, etc., reflecting on the progress that you've made, any kind of challenges you faced, and what you want to do moving forward. This one's set up as a quarterly goal reflection, so I listed out what my goals had been for the quarter that passed, what highlights or achievements did I have related to those goals, what lowlights or challenges did I face, and how could I make better progress on the quarter ahead. I then also had a separate little reflection space for each of those goals individually. So rewriting out the goal title, talking about the status of the goal. So am I keeping it or am I tweaking it, etc. So for instance, this one got demoted from a main goal to a mini goal. This one was still happening, but it wasn't a focus. And this one was also still happening, but wasn't a focus. I also just wrote some notes about each of those and gave them a little progress bar. You can see that all of them were about half finished. How in depth you get with your reflection is very much up to you, but I encourage you to do the reflection process because it just really helps clarify what's working, what's not working, how can we make more progress. If you don't necessarily want to do your goal setting on a quarterly or annual basis, maybe you want to look a little bit further afield, then you could set up something like an apocalypse. So a list of things that you want to do before the apocalypse. It's essentially just a cute name for a bucket list. I just like this term better. As suggested by the title, it is just a list of things that I want to do. You could set it up more decoratively. I wanted to keep this one simple. Of course, as you can see, I have a lot of space on this list for more things to add, but if you wanted to strip it back just a little bit, you could instead set up a list like a 60 before I'm 60, or 50 before 50, 40 before 40, 100 before 100, whichever age you want to focus on. 
As the title suggests, this is a list of 60 things that I, in theory, want to get done before I'm 60. These are all actually just ideas, they're not my actual 60 before 60 list. Not that I have one, because I have an apocalypse. You've stuck with this video for long enough now that I feel like you must be one of the real MVPs, so I feel safe to tell you, but shh. It is a secret. I was kind of hoping that this year I would make my own goal planner. So not in the sense of like drawing one up for me personally, but actually getting one like properly made and printed so that other people could have one too if they wanted. This goal of mine is nowhere near actually being like physically formed yet. I've still got a lot of work to do, but I am hoping to work on that this year. So stay tuned for that. A type of goal that a lot of people have though is related to either saving more or spending less. And that's what our next set of ideas looks at. I find that the right layout in your bullet journal can have a very big impact on whether you do or don't do something or do or don't achieve something. So our next lot of ideas are 12 different savings or spending less challenges for your journal. The first one we have is a version of the 2323s in 2023, but this is effectively 23 times that you saved $23 in the year of 2023. Of course, if you're setting this up for a different year, you can use different amounts, but at the end of a challenge like this, you will have saved yourself $529. This tracker is just set up so that it is 23 boxes across and 23 boxes tall, and each time you save a dollar, you just put a dot in the relevant box. You could try and save these in lump sums, so saving $23 at once each time, or you could just save a dollar here and there and keep track of it in this way. At the bottom, I've also got a space to log when I reached that goal. So when I reached my first 23 saved, my second 23, and so on. The next idea we have is a savings or spendings year in pixels. Oftentimes year in pixels is used for tracking moods, but you can use it to track other things and saving and spendings could be one of those things. On this one, we've got a key set up so that you can log how much you spent or saved that day. I've set it up as if they're looking at spending. So $0 spent is blue, under $10 spent is green, under 20 spent is red, and then over 20 is black. Then for each of the relevant days, you just go and put a dot in to signify what the spending was. I've also got a space to log how much spending you had per month and how much saving you had per month. Flipping over, and the next idea we have is that of the dollar a day challenge. So trying to save one dollar each day for the year. If you're successful, then by the end of the year, you will have saved at least $365. For this one though, I've just set it up as a year at a glance, so mini calendars for each of the months of the year, and then you just put a little green dot for any of the days that you did save the dollar, and a little red dot for any of the days that you didn't. You could of course change this one to be $2 a day or more, just make sure that it's realistic. The next challenge we have is that of the roundup challenge. So every time that you're buying a specific item, you round up to the nearest dollar amount and then save the difference. So for instance, if your coffee is $3.50, you round that up to $4 and save the 50 cents each time. I don't buy a lot of coffee. I have absolutely no idea if that's a reasonable amount for a coffee, but hopefully you guys get the idea. On this one though, you have a place to list out what the item is, what the cost of the item is, how much the roundup saving will be. So for our coffee, it was the 50 cents. And then multiply that by how many coffees you get in a specific period of time. So this could be on a monthly basis, or you could do it for the full year if you wanted to. Just make sure that you have a good way to log how many of each of those items you're actually purchasing. Then in the last column, you can sum up the total saving and then total that up at the bottom to see how much you saved. Flipping over, the next one we have is what I'm calling the 100, 99, 98, etc. challenge. For this one, I've set it up so that we have a little envelope for each of those numbers. And the idea is that you save the amount on the envelope. So saving $1, $2, $3, so on and so forth. By the end of saving each of these different sums of money, you will have saved $5,050. So adding up the numbers 1 through 100, that's how much you'll save. I've just done these numbers in order, so 1, 2, 3, etc but you could randomize the numbers if you want and work through in whichever random order you've set yourself up for. Effectively though, every time that you save the amount on the envelope, you could just color the envelope in. The next idea is that of a Tetris saving tracker. So each of your different Tetris pieces represents a certain amount of money. And as you save that amount, you put it onto your Tetris board. 
You could also set up so that you have a specific reward as you complete lines, just like in Tetris where you complete a line and you get points for it. That kind of gamification can help keep you motivated to save more. Flipping over though, and the next saving challenge we have is the My Number Challenge, or it's effectively a 52 week challenge. But you pick a number from 1 to 10, and then you multiply that number by a different amount each week. So for the first week, you're going to take your number and multiply it by 1, and whatever the result of that is, is how much you'll try and save. In the second week, you're going to multiply it by 3, and then whatever the result of that is, you're going to try and save that much each week. Do be careful when picking your number because some of the multiplications kind of get a little big. For instance, we have a times 14 here and times 13. So if you've picked the number 10, that's $140 to save that week and $130 to save that week. Of course, whichever multiplier you're using, you can set up so it's reasonable for you. But this one can be a bit of fun. For instance, let's just say that this person's number was 5. So if they can write down that their number was 5. Then 5 times 1 gives them $5 to save that first week. 3 times 5 gives them $15 to save in the second week. The third week it's 5 times 5, so it's $25 to save. So on and so forth. Oof, the next one's $55. That is a bit of money. <laughs> Obviously, depending on which numbers you pick, the total amount that you're going to save is going to be different. But you will at least save $52, if you're using whole numbers, of course. The next idea we have is Saveopoly, which you can probably tell is a play on Monopoly. But for each paycheck you get, you roll a dice and move yourself around the board and save according to where you land. I've used a combination of different numbers here. So we've got just straight dollar amounts. So save $2, save $5, save $7. We also have percentage of paycheck. So save 1% of your paycheck, save 5%, 8%. And we've also got multiplying the die roll. So three times whatever your roll was, or five times whatever your roll was. And I've also just chucked in some roll again spaces. If you wanted to, you could very much set it up so that anytime you can't pay the amount, you do go to jail or something, and then you have to try and pay your way out of jail. I don't know, however you want to set it up. But it is supposed to be fun. Don't make it like a punishment thing. Flipping over though, and our next saving challenge is that of a sell it off challenge. So decluttering pretty much your entire house or whatever space you want to. And then for whatever things you're decluttering that are still worth something, selling those off and then seeing how much you can make from it. I've broken this up into different areas of the house. So kitchen and the items you're selling from there, living room, etc. And then what price you're asking or hoping to get for it and the total that you're hoping to get from all of those sales. I love decluttering, it's like my favourite sport, and then being able to sell those items off and get yourself a little extra cash is effectively a bonus. The next idea we have is that of a monthly savings challenges, so having a little calendar for each of the months of the year, and then instead of writing the header being the month title, so like January, February, you put in a little challenge for that month. All of my challenges are intended for savings, so having your lunch from home rather than buying it out, having meat-free meals because meat can be expensive, not getting bubble tea, oh! Of course, the challenges that you want to pick are up to you. Make it so that they're actually going to save you money. If you already don't buy bubble tea, there's not a lot of point having a challenge to not buy bubble tea. It's not gonna be much of a challenge. Turning over to our next challenge though, this is the loose change challenge. This is particularly good for people who like to pay in cash for things. So at the start of the week, you get out a certain amount of cash. And then at the end of the week, after making your purchases, anything that's left over as change is something that you try and save. Because this one is done on a weekly basis, we have 52 spaces here. So one space for each week of the year. And then for each of those, you can just write down how much you saved and total it up at the end. I've also put in a space to write out what your average per week was, just if you're curious. The one we have on the right here though is the how low can you go challenge. So this one is kind of looking at it more from a budgeting point of view. So looking at the different categories that you spend your money on and how much you're spending in that area each month. Then for the subsequent month, you try and spend less. Of course, some months have an unfair advantage. For instance, February, which only has 28 days versus January. So there's kind of an expectation that you might spend less in the months that have less days. But once you write out how much you have spent, you can also use a color code to denote how much over or under 
or on par the month prior you were. So for example, let's just say you spent $100 on groceries in January, because it's easy, but then in February you only spent $80 on groceries. That would have been over 10% lower than last month, because 10% less of $100 is $90, and you spent less than $90. If percentages aren't really your thing, you could of course make these into static numbers, so $20 higher than the last month, $20 lower than the last month, or within $20 of the last month. But it can be a little bit of fun. Again, kind of trying to gamify our goals. One of the ways that I'm trying to gamify my spending habits this year is by doing a no spend slash low spend challenge. So effectively setting myself some rules around what I can and can't spend money on, and then trying to live within those rules. I know I'm not a perfect person, so I'm really only kind of aiming for a 70% success rate, but that will still have a measured improvement on the amount of money I'm able to save. So far, so good. For our next lot of collection ideas though, I know that the title of this video initially had people confused because I couldn't really find a way of succinctly saying, these bullet journal ideas are to help you build and maintain your social connections and romantic relationships. So what I went with was building better relationships with your bullet journal, which people kind of thought meant like keeping up or staying consistent. But anywho, our next lot of ideas are about building connections with others. Let's have a look. Our first idea is that of a birthday and anniversary log. This one's effectively set up like a future log, just themed to being around birthdays and anniversaries. It's always kind of awkward when you miss somebody's birthday and then don't really notice and then they wish you a happy birthday and you're like, wow, I'm a lame friend. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. But having a spread like this can help avoid that awkwardness. You could also set this style of page up with little check boxes so that you can tick off when you have wished them a happy birthday or gotten them a gift or whatever you want to do to acknowledge that happening. As you can see, this one's just set up so that we have a box for each month. So January through to June and then July through to December. What could also be useful for a page like this is setting it up in a long-term collections journal so that you don't have to write it out year after year. Flipping over though, and our next idea is that of friend notes. This is effectively a place to, as kind of suggested, write notes about your friends. And you'd probably have a page or half page per person. So you can write down things like their name, so you know which friend it's about, when their birthday is, what are their favorite things, so color, foods, drinks, movies, books, etc. You can also use this as a place to write out mini gift ideas. So if you want to do them something nice that's just small, then the things that you could do as part of that. It doesn't necessarily have to be things that you get them either. It could just be other acts of kindness. And then also ideas for bigger gifts too, for things like birthdays, other celebrations where you give gifts, that kind of stuff. I've also got a space at the bottom here for other notes, so things like past presents that you've given or received from them, passing comments that they've made about stuff they like, etc. In terms of our next idea, this one is the 36 questions to fall in love. Now, you'll probably note that I do only have 20 of them listed out here. I didn't think I actually had to write out all 36 for you to kind of get the idea on this one. A link to the full list of 36 questions can be found in the description box, but the general idea behind this list is that these questions, if you and somebody else go through them from 1 to 36 and answer honestly about each of them, as a whole they will bring you closer together. They are technically in set portions, so I think set 1 is like here-ish and set 2 is here, but I think there's a couple more. As mentioned, the link to the list is in the description box, along with links to any of the equipment I used to set up these spreads. On to the next page, and the first idea we have here is that of love language notes. From my understanding, there are five love languages, so words of affirmation, physical touch, receiving gifts, quality time, and acts of service. This one's set up so that we have the love languages down the side. You have a space next to each of them to write who in your life is receptive to that type of love language. And then a space to list out any kind of actions or communication techniques that you could use to show that love language. Or that you could use for them so that they know that they are loved. This can just be helpful information to note so that you know for the different people in your life that you value, your actions towards them are being received in the way intended. Our next idea is that of event planning, which is a bit more of a kind of technical idea, I suppose. But planning events can lead to making memorable moments. 
I've kept this one pretty simple, so just a space to write when it's happening, where's it gonna be, who's coming, what are we actually doing, and then just some other little general planning notes for that event in particular. As a separate idea, you could also make a memory keeping page for that event so that you can reflect back on it in years to come. The next idea we have though is a contact log, just to ensure that you're actually keeping in touch with people that you wanna keep in touch with. I've set this one up as a table, so we have who, when, how and what. So for example, let's just say on the 11th of December, I contacted mum, I did it via FaceTime, and it was just a general catch up. A layout like this can just make sure that you're actually being mindful of when you are keeping in touch with people, and it also acts as a record of when you haven't kept in touch with people. You could also have a space here to denote whether you initiated the contact or they did, just to make sure that you're kind of being reciprocal in that relationship. Flipping over and we have another log idea, but this one is a conflict log. Now it sounds negative and technically speaking it can be, but the real purpose of a log like this is to note what kind of things are causing tension in your relationships. In this one we have some columns at the front to denote what type of conflict it was or what kind of initiated the conflict. So I've just used little icons for these, you could of course just write them out. So maybe the dollar sign means it was a conflict about money or finances. The unsmiley face could be maybe somebody was feeling sad or was made to feel bad about something. And then we've got a couple other icons that could mean other things. You could of course just have a column to write out what caused the conflict rather than using a style like this, but we also have a space to write out who the conflict was with, when the conflict happened, and to check off when or if it has been resolved. You could also denote how it was resolved or what kind of strategies that you guys used to get through that conflict. The purpose of this log is not to make people feel bad about things, it's just more for information that you can use to help strengthen your relationships. What kind of things are causing tension? How can we fix those? Another log idea, but a little bit more positive, is that of a kindness log. So a place to record things like gifts, nice words, etc. This is another one that's kind of targeted at making sure that you're maintaining your relationships, but also to notice that things aren't one-sided. Other people are doing things for you too. In this one we have three columns, so we have who, which I've set up to be like me to someone or someone to me, just so that you could see the kind of directionality of that kindness. A place to write down the date that it happened, and a place to write down what happened. You could of course set that section up more like this style here, the Alastair method, where you've got different icons to represent different things. So maybe an icon to represent they gifted you something, an icon to represent kind words, so on and so forth. The next idea we have is that of a relationship tracker, and this one was taken from Elise of Miss McKenna's Life Leverage. She does have a dedicated video related to this tracker, but it's effectively structured like a regular habit tracker, but just focusing on relationships. In particular, her one focuses on her relationship with her partner. I've set this one up in a vertical style, so we have numbers 1 through 31 down the side of both sections of the tracker to represent each of the days of the month, and then each column represents a different relationship-related happening. So status is for whether you guys are kind of in a good place with your relationship, if things are in an okay-ish place, or if things are kind of negative on that day. You can just use different icons to represent that. We then have a space to denote any conflict, so similar to the conflict log from before, but looking at the relationship as a whole. Whether that was resolved, was your love language used on that day, or did you use it for them? Did you have sex? Did you have snuggles? Really, whatever you want to track depending on the specifics of your relationship. Remember, take the ideas but tweak them so that they actually suit you. This part of the tracker here is about hours of time spent together, quality time kind of stuff but you do this one more on a scale. So this column of dots represents no time spent. This is two hours, four hours, six hours, and at the end of the month, you'll effectively have either a bar graph or a line graph, depending on how you set it up. Flipping on over to the next page though, and the first idea we have here is that of date night ideas. I've set these ones up as themed lists, so free date night ideas, ones that are $20 or less, and ones that are $40 or less. Having a reference like this can just be a nice go-to when you guys want to plan a date night, but possibly you might only have so much to spend on it. You can of course theme them in different ways, so ones that are date nights in the house, date nights outside of the house, date nights that are a little bit further afield. The way that you want to theme it, completely up to you, but I find that theming lists just makes them a little bit more user-friendly. 
The idea we have under this one is that of alphabet dates, and this idea comes from Erin of Erin Flodo Designs. I absolutely love this idea and I totally want to incorporate it into my life next year. The idea for this one though is that you and your partner take it in turns to pick dates based on the letters of the alphabet. So maybe they start with A and they choose to take you abseiling. And you wonder why, because both you and they are afraid of heights. <laughs> But for the next date, it is your choice and it is B, so you take them on a brunch date. So on and so forth. Super cute idea, totally want to do this. Of course, this is another one that could be combined with memory keeping or memory logging, I guess. I think it would make for a really cute memory. The idea we have on this side though is that of relationship meeting notes. Having regular relationship meetings with your significant other can really help to strengthen your relationship. And the structure of this one goes with positives first, so what's going well, expressing gratitude for each other. Then it's the nuts and bolts, so the kind of house admin stuff. We have the keeping connected section, which is talking about what things you've enjoyed together, but also discussing any kind of pain points or concerns you have. And then dreaming big, focusing on the future, before closing it out by thanking each other and having some kind of small fun task you can do together. On this one, I've also included a space for further notes that you might take during that kind of meeting. This is kind of for the agenda, and that's the notes space. It doesn't necessarily need to be as formal as this, but going in with a plan can help. This one in particular is elaborated on a blog post from My Sweet Home Life, which is linked in the description box too. I feel like we don't see a lot of pages in people's bullet journals that are specifically related to building connections with others. That's probably because a lot of the time that kind of stuff would be quite personal. When you're sharing things on the internet, you're not necessarily too sure at who's going to see them. But that's why I figured it was a valuable video to share. Something I do feel we see a lot of, or at least it seems that we're seeing increasing amounts of it these days, is reading journal content and it is making me so dang jealous and like I really want to make a reading journal even though I know I don't need one. In my soul, I know this, but I want one. But regardless, that didn't stop me from making a list of 12 reading challenges that you could put in your reading journal. I mean, technically you could put these in your regular bullet journal too if you still wanted to do a reading challenge. But let's jump in and have a look at what those challenges are. Our first challenge is the alphabet challenge or the A to Z challenge and this is effectively just about finding a book title or an author that starts with each letter of the alphabet. As you read a book that comes under that letter you just write the title in next to that letter. You could just set this one up as a simple list view or you could do a bookshelf or just the covers or really whatever you want. All of the actual layouts in this video are just ideas along with the challenges themselves so feel completely free to change up the actual format or layout of the idea. The next idea we have is the Read the Rainbow Challenge, and this one is very much based on the book covers. So looking at the book covers and picking out the kind of main colour in each of them, and trying to read a book for each colour of the rainbow. I know some of you are thinking it, yes, pink and black are not technically part of the rainbow, but I like the idea of including them too. You can get as specific with your colours as you want. The ones I've gone for are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, pink and black, but you could also include brown, grey, different shades of colours, so maybe an indigo or a teal. The idea behind this one is that once you had read that book, you'd print out a little picture of the cover and then stick it over each of these sections. Another challenge idea is that of a genre exploration, and this is what my book club did this year. So we looked at 12 different genres throughout the year, where we had a genre per month and had a monthly book club book dedicated to that genre. You could either assign the genres to the month ahead of time, but what we did instead was used a spinning wheel and spun each month for the genre for the month ahead. So for us, we had historical fiction in January, we had horror in February, we had romance in March, so on and so forth. I've just listed out the genres themselves, but you could also structure this one so that you can have a space to write in the book title, an author, maybe give the book a rating if you wanted to. It's just a way to get you outside of your comfort zone when it comes to genres, so you can explore different genres and see if you like those as well. Flipping over, and our next idea is our Read Around the World Challenge. If the title didn't give it away, then the map probably does. But effectively the idea is that you're trying to read books that are either set in different countries around the world, or from authors from different countries. 
As you read a book that fits that country, you would just colour it in on the map. And then we've also got a list section down the bottom so that you could write out what the title of the book is, author, other details, whatever you want to record. The next challenge we have is that of a reflective reading challenge. And this one's very much about thinking about your personal characteristics and then trying to find books that reflect those characteristics or characters that reflect those characteristics. This could be characteristics that you either already kind of have or ones that you're trying to build upon. So kind of using those characters as inspiration to help you build that ability or trait in yourself. Again, this one's just set up as a simple list view. So you'd list out what the characteristic was and then the book that you read that kind of mirrored or fit that characteristic. They don't just have to be mental characteristics either. They could be physical characteristics if you prefer. It's effectively just trying to find a representation of yourself through your reading. Talking about representation, our next challenge is that of a representation or diversity reads challenge. Diversity means different things to different people. It also probably very much depends on the kind of stuff you read already. But this one's set up as a bingo board, so with different types of diversity reads that you could have in your diversity challenge. As you can probably tell, this one is a printout and a link to this one and the world map that I used and pretty much any kind of printable thing that I used can be found in the description box below, along with all of the other materials that I used in this setup. Turning over to the next page though, I of course had to include a year in pixels here, but this one is a year of reading challenge. So looking at each day of the year and denoting something about your reading. This one is set up based on amount of time read. So a little gray dot for no reading, a pale orange dot for one to 30 minutes, and then a kind of darker orange or kind of tan color for more than 30 minutes. The way this one works is that we have one through 31 written down the side to represent the 31 days in, I mean, the largest months. And then we also have initials for each of the months along the top. So each of these dot grid boxes represents one of the days in the year. Of course, the bottom line here is jagged because we do not have 31 days in every month. Of course, you don't have to do it for time read. You could do it for type of reading. So did I listen to audiobooks today? Did I read something in a physical copy? You could also do it for the different genres that you're reading. You could also denote whether you finished a book that day. Really, what you want to put on here, completely up to you. It is just an example. Another one that is pretty popular is that of a bookshelfy, or effectively a bookshelf that you try and fill up with books. However many books you put in here, completely up to you. Depends on how much you like to read. Personally, when I have set these up, I try and use larger books on the bookshelf so that it looks full, but there's less books because I don't read all that much. The idea for this one though is that you fill it with the book outlines and then as you read those books you can color them in, you could also write the titles of the books on them, or you could fill it with book prompts like we have on our book bingo. Now I know we had a bingo board before but that one was for our diversity reads challenge. This one has prompts that aren't so much tailored to that, so things like the book cover is my favorite color, or this book has 400 or more pages, this book was a 5 star read. As you read books that fit each of these, you'd then just color them in, or what I've done is given them an individual little outline. You could also set it up so that your first horizontal or diagonal or vertical gives you some kind of a prize, and then some kind of prize for filling the bingo board in full. Or you might just view the reading as reward enough and leave it as it is. It's just another fun challenge. Flipping over, the next one we have is a head-to-head -head challenge, or what is also sometimes called a book bracket tournament. In this one, you're effectively pitting your books against each other. So taking the top read from each of the months, so January, February, March, April, May, June, etc. And then thinking about them in pairs, which one of those was your favorite? So for January versus February, which one did you actually enjoy more? Which one had a higher rating or something like that? That one moves on to the next round. This happens for each of the month pairs, so March and April, and then the winner from that, May and June, the winner from that, July and August, the winner from that, so on. And this brings us to our next tier. So the next tier, because we have 12 months of the year, I could have done another like two versus two, but then it starts to get a little messy. So instead what I've done is three versus three. So your top read from January, Feb, your top read from March, April, and your top read from May, June. And then of those three, which one was your top read? That one moves on 
to the final round. Hopefully you can kind of see what I mean, but at the end of the year you will have your top read, you'll have the runner-up from whichever didn't win the final challenge, you'll have the runner-up runners-up, which will be in here, whichever ones didn't progress forward, so on and so forth. You could also do this one as kind of more like a tally table, so pairing up all of the books against each other to get a kind of definitive ranking, so January versus Feb, and January versus March, and January versus April, so on and so forth, and see who comes out on top that way. The next idea we have is that of a book awards page, and I thought this was a really fun idea. This one I saw from Psychonaut Journaling on YouTube. But effectively, at the end of your year or reading period, you're gonna give your books award based on different random categories. The categories are up to you, but I've got a couple of examples. So, my top read, the book that made me cry the most, best series, or most relatable character. It's effectively like the Goodreads Choice Awards, except the choices are yours. <laughs> The next one we have is a fact versus fiction challenge, and the way this one would work is that you have a series of prompts that you decide ahead of time, and then for each of those prompts you try and find a book that would be a fiction book that relates to the prompt, and a non-fiction book that relates to the prompt. I've done this one quite simply in just thinking about the first word in each of the book titles, so Atomic Love versus Atomic Habits, Can't Look Away versus Can't Hurt Me. Primal Fear versus Primal Branding, etc. Of course, this is the super simple version because you're just looking at the names of the books, which is a little bit easier, but you could also do these based on other themes as well. Eventually, one of these days, I'm just going to give in to peer pressure and actually make a reading journal, even though I know I don't need one, but I want one. I think it's probably just the aesthetic of it that's really getting to me. I love the scrapbooky look of those notebooks, and I think that's kind of what I really want to do. But with the vintage papers and the soft pinks, it's just like a very pretty aesthetic. On the topic of aesthetics though, I know that one of the reasons that people state when they say, oh, I couldn't possibly bullet journal, is because they don't consider themselves an artist. And you and I both know that you do not need to be an artist to do bullet journaling, but I also don't think there's anything wrong with wanting your layouts to look nice. I mean, I know that I am way less inclined to actually use my bullet journal if I don't like the way the pages look. But one of the things that we can do to kind of remedy that is pick easy themes, you know, easy ways of decorating our journal. That's what our next segment's about. 12 different easy bullet journal themes that you could use in your journal. The ones that look really visually effective, but don't take hours upon hours to do. Let's have a look. Of course, the term easy really depends on who you're talking to. It is all a matter of personal perspective, but each of these themes I do feel could be done in a nice and simplistic way for if you're in a hurry. Some of these themes I've actually used myself in the past year because I was in a hurry. I was a little bit pinched on time and just needed something quick and simple. So I do very much think that they could be useful for you. Now, I know I just said that these ones are easy, and I do stand by that. Some of them you may be a little bit apprehensive about, like the fact that I'm using a paintbrush right here. You'll be like, Jess, what the heck? You said this was going to be straightforward. You don't need to use paint. I just had the paints out and available, so I thought I'd use them. You could just use a gold gel pen or a paint marker or whatever else you have on hand. But our first theme idea is that of a black and gold theme. The nice part about this is that you can apply it to pretty much any other type of theme as well. I've decided just to do simple stars on a piece of blackout paper, mainly because I find stars to just be very simple lines and dots, and they're a very easy way to add a little bit of decoration to a page. These paints in particular, absolutely gorgeous, totally recommend them, and you don't really need to be a painting enthusiast or expert to use them well. They add some beautiful shine to the page, as I said, 100% recommend. But black and gold is a very nice and easy theme. It's also a totally gorgeous and a tried and true color palette. You can use it for things like an art deco theme, you could do stars like I'm doing here, a tiger theme, a classy birthday theme, or just use the color palette in general. Our second theme idea is one of the ones that I think you're going to be a little apprehensive about, but that is a theme of plaid. And I know you're going to say, but Jess, you did plaid in your start of journal setup and you complained about how long it took you. That is correct, but I was also doing a different type of plaid. Not all plaids are created equal. This one is nice and simple because it is just doing some vertical and some horizontal lines with your brush marker. I'm using the Tombows, but you could do this with mild liners or Crayola super tips or essentially any kind of marker of that style. And you're doing those lines both vertically and then horizontally. 
I also decided to add a little bit of extra detail by adding a dashed line in between the ones that are done with the marker. And to do that, I just use a Statler Triplus Fineliner. Again, all of the materials are linked in the description box. Doing plaid in this way though is much more straightforward than the type of plaid that I did in my start of journal setup. Our next theme is another one that you might find familiar if you've been here for a while, and that is a fireflies theme. The nice part is, is that you can draw these ones super stylized and super quickly, and it makes for a really cute theme. I've gone mainly with the idea of the fireflies being yellow, but all of these color palettes are just suggestions. For instance, you do not have to have yellow fireflies. You don't have to have plaid that's done in browns and pinks. And in the future themes we have, you don't have to stick with those color palettes either. I've actually just noticed that three of the color palettes that we have here are either a gold and blue combo or a yellow and blue combo. Wasn't necessarily intentional, but again, they are all just suggestions. Our fourth theme idea is that of a minimal geometric theme. There are a bunch of ways that you can do this, but these ones make for really nice easy theme ideas because they're really just dots and lines. You can find some excellent ideas online for these ones, but the geometric themes always end up looking super pretty, especially if you make sure to keep your line straight. So you might either want to use a ruler for anything that's a longer straight line, or just take your time for any of the lines that are a bit shorter and that you want to freehand. A lot of the time people won't use colour with minimal geometric themes, they'll just leave it to the line work, but I decided to colour mine in. Another theme that might seem familiar is that of a rain or rain clouds theme. Another super simple one, as with all of the themes on this page, I suppose. But these can be really cute ways to decorate your page headers or the corners. And you can also do creative things with trackers, like how many raindrops, the size of the raindrops, how far down the page the rain has fallen, etc. In terms of color palette for this kind of a theme, you could go a little bit more subdued with a kind of like gloomy days rain cloud theme, or you could go really bright and vibrant with something like a rain cloud and rainbows theme. We love themes with good diversity. It's always cool to see how people interpret the same theme differently in their journals. Paper planes is a theme that looks complicated, but is actually fairly straightforward. You just need to find some reference image of the paper planes, and there are heaps online. I'd recommend going to Pinterest and searching something like paper plane doodles, and you'll find them in a whole bunch of different directions, orientations, which means that you can get really good variety in the way that your decoration looks without a lot of effort. The basis for a paper plane is essentially a triangle, because that's kind of the shape that the top of it makes. So you just draw your triangles pointing in different directions and then adding in those details. Again, I'd recommend looking at Pinterest for how to add those details in so that they look semi-realistic without a lot of effort. I also like to add the little dotted lines at the end of the paper planes to make it look like they're kind of traveling through the air. And that's another really cute way to add decoration that's not too hard. The next theme idea we have is that of bubbles. And this one's really easy because it's effectively just circles, but because they are natural shapes, they don't have to be perfectly circular. Technically speaking, you could use a circle stencil, like the one that I have from Statler, which I personally find super helpful and would totally recommend. That one would help you get nice evenly sized circles, or circles that are actually circular, rather than maybe slightly squashed circles. For this one though, they were fairly small, I didn't feel the need to use the stencil. And while you can get bubble themes that are super detailed and like done on blackout paper and they're absolutely gorgeous, it can also just be a really nice simple theme because you're effectively just adding different sized circles to your page. You could also add in a little bit of a highlight with either a white gel pen or draw it in with your regular fine liner just for a little bit of added detail, but it isn't super necessary. Up next, the theme that we have in the middle of the page here is that of a Polaroid theme. This one's nice and easy because you effectively just start with a square for where the Polaroid picture part is, and then you draw a rectangle around that square to be the white space that goes around the picture. Hopefully that makes sense, but it is effectively just a combination of two very simple shapes. This is another one you could probably use a stencil for if you have a square stencil. I do have one, so I did use it when setting this up. That one's called a Mathomat. It is something that I had in like primary school, so I've had it for a while. They do still sell it. It's available at an Australian website though, so I don't know how available it is in other places. You can see behind the Polaroids though, I did also decide to add in a grid background. So kind of to represent a pegboard, that part totally isn't necessary and you could freehand it to speed the process up a little bit. 
I decided to roll mine in just because I wanted the lines nice and straight, but it is very simple. You're just drawing a bunch of vertical lines and then a bunch of horizontal lines. You can also add other embellishments around the Polaroids and you don't have to fill them in with patterns like I've done here. Previously, when I've done Polaroid themes, I've done things like washi tape to fill those in because that's nice and simple. Or you could use stickers or you could draw little doodles, really whatever you want. A very flexible theme. The next one I felt like I had to include, and that is the idea of simple botanicals. Botanicals and flowers are something that are pretty big in the bullet journal community. I don't typically gravitate towards florals myself, but leaf work like this is something that I very much appreciate. And this one is actually really simple. This one is loosely inspired by pine, so you just start by drawing the stems, which effectively just a bunch of sticks with sticky outy bits, and then draw a bunch of little green and then draw a bunch of little lines coming off this to represent the pine needles. You can also add other embellishments like little dots to represent berries or something like that, other little leaf shapes. But these types of elements are very easy and quick to repeat throughout the pages of a setup. So make for a great theme. Moving to the top of the right hand page though, this idea is a cross stitch theme. I've been wanting to do a theme like this for a while because I just think it would be a lot of fun. You can find a lot of really simple cross stitch patterns online and that's probably where I would go for inspiration. I say probably, that's literally where I went for inspiration. So we have a little cross stitch duck that I'm drawing out here, but because it's cross stitch, it effectively ends up kind of like pixelized art. Things don't have to be super detailed. You're really just going for the general outline of shapes and using the quote, correct colors to give the overall look of something. For each of my crosses, I've taken up a quarter of one of the dock grid boxes. So they're roughly two and a half millimeters by two and a half millimeters. But you could do your crosses bigger or smaller depending on the design that you want to put on your page. Our next idea is one that I often find intimidating but is actually fairly straightforward once you get into it. And that is the idea of spider webs. Now, I know that spiders aren't for everyone, but I do appreciate the aesthetic of spider webs. You do not actually have to include the spiders. I do in this one just you know, for the sake of completeness, but you don't have to. But this is another one that you can find really good inspiration pictures online just by searching something like spiderweb doodles or spiderweb illustrations. Similar to the minimal geometric theme, this is one that people would typically just leave in black and white, but I decided to add a little stripe of red on the back of the spider to make them a red back spider. If super easy is what you're wanting then, a nice easy theme idea is that of using washi tape or stickers to inspire your theme. For this one, you just collect up your stickers or washi of choice, consult your pen stash to find some complementary or matching colors, and then go to town decorating your page. These stickers in particular are ones that I featured in my video on five minute weekly spread ideas, which might be another video that you wanna check out. I really love videos like our last segment where you just have kind of a small collection of theme ideas that you can pick and choose from. It just makes the choice process a little bit easier because you're not picking from the whole wide world of theme ideas. It's just a selection of 12. This is very much one of the ways that makes theme picking easier. It's just kind of restricting or narrowing the playing field when it comes to what you're actually choosing from in terms of a theme. One way that you can do this is by using what we call a year long theme or effectively an overarching theme that all of your individual month to month themes fall under. So for instance, maybe your year long theme is animals. So you have one month dedicated to hippos, one month dedicated to tigers, one month dedicated to dogs, so on and so forth. So for our next idea in this lineup, we're gonna have a look at 12 year long themes that you could do in your journal. And for each of those, I have 12 theme ideas. So 144 themes, let's go. Our first year long theme is that of a rainbow theme where each of the months of the year gets its own color. I've gone ahead and assigned a color to each of the months of the year, as you can see here. And I've also included gold as a New Year's theme for January, kind of to go with the idea of the gold at the end of the rainbow. The nice part about a theme like this is that the color palette is super simple. You just collect up all of your materials of that color for each month and use them in your journal as decoration. This can be particularly good if you're kind of new to the idea of monthly themes or don't want to put a lot of effort into like doodling or decoration outside of just using color. Our next idea is also color related and that is a color theme. Now, this is a little different to the rainbow idea in that we're not gonna have different colors for each month, but instead you're gonna be picking one color and choosing themes around that. 
For the example list we have here, the color that I went with was green. So each month has a theme where that thing is primarily green. Things like limes and frogs and aliens. Not to say that aliens are necessarily green, can't, can't say I've seen an alien before, but in pop culture we do often see them represented in green. Our next idea for a year-long theme is that of foods, and these could be your favourite foods or just foods that have good visual appeal. You could also pick them based on their seasonality. So there might be a particular season or a particular month that that food is known for. For instance, candy for things like Halloween in October, or technically for Valentine's Day in February. Or you could just pick them because you like them. Following off that idea, you could of course do something like a fruits theme for the year, where you have a different type of fruit for each month. That would be a nice easy way to limit your colour palette as well. So oranges, limes, lemons, cherries, etc. Our next theme idea is one that you may have seen on YouTube already, so shout out to Marisa Kazem for this one. But you could do a Disney princesses theme. Depending on where you look, there are either 12 or 13 Disney princesses. But technically, if you included all 13, then you also have a start of journal setup theme for yourself. I've just assigned the Disney princesses to the months in order of release. But you could get a little more specific about which one goes to which month based on any kind of criteria. The nice part about this year-long theme is that because there is a limited number of Disney princesses, it does very much limit the choice making you have to do because there are only so many of them and there are only so many months. Another year long theme idea that comes with a shout out, we have birthstones or flowers, which you may have seen done by Katie of Dark Sunlight. I think she did that a couple of years ago now, but in this one you use the birthstones or birth flowers or a combination of both to do your monthly setups. This is another one that's nice in terms of choice making because those are already assigned to months, you don't really have to think about it but you can use those as pretty ways to decorate your monthly setups. You might want to use the flowers in particular for doodle type decoration and the birthstone colors as a color palette, or maybe you want to use the flowers as the color palette. Completely up to you, it's just an idea. Again, I've listed those all out here, and depending on where you look, the stone slash flower might be different. A couple of the months have multiple stones and multiple flowers, so I just picked one. But our next idea, which is also very related, is that of star signs. This is another one where you don't really have to make many choices about which one goes with which month. I've assigned these so that the star sign that makes up the majority of the month is the one that is tied to that month. For instance, if we think about Libra, because I'm a Libra, my birthday's in October, and that's also where the majority of the period of time for the Libra star sign falls. Technically it starts in September, but the majority of it is in October. You could of course move all of these so that then it's the month that it starts in, so Libra for September. But our next idea is that of fandoms. This is another one that gets a shout out because I know that Beth of Dots and Beyond has done fandoms in her journal. I've listed out some popular ones here and let me know in the comments below which ones of these you actually know the source material of. Obviously I know because I made the list, but I want to see how many of these are recognizable by our community. Effectively a year long theme like this though would end up being things like book series, movies, TV shows, those kind of things that have fandoms attached to them. I think technically some celebrities and musicians and bands have fandoms associated with them, so I guess we could also include them in that lineup too. Our next year long theme idea though is that of comics and or manga. I've decided to make my list based on manga though, so here's a collection of ones that I found that I think are popular. I don't really read manga, but with that said, I do super want to do a Sailor Moon theme in my journal. I think that would be a lot of fun. While these ones are all manga, as I said, you could also do this related to comics. So you could have the Batman comics, the Superman comics, I don't really read comics, but one that I know of is that of Spider-Man. So our next idea is the Spider-Verse. Of course, an extension of this theme is into any kind of media that has multiple characters and looking at them, one for each month. But I figured there are plenty of Spider-Men to go around, so you could assign a different Spidey to each month. So Spidey Gwen, Spidey Ham, Spidey Noir, etc. The nice part about that is that for the majority of the year, you'd only need blue and red, but we do of course have some Spideys in there that do not fall within that color palette. Our next idea is another one that comes with a shout out, so shout out to Torrin of Torrin Marie, and you may have seen her series of doing different countries in her bullet journal. 
These could again be countries that you want to visit, or maybe there's a particular festival in that country for each of those months. I've just got a random collection here, but I know that when Torrin does her setups, she likes to focus on a bunch of different things about that country and really do her research, so it could be a good way to find out more about countries that you someday want to visit. A year-long theme idea that a lot of people subscribe to, even if not for the whole year though, is that of popular holidays. So looking at the different months of the year and picking one holiday per month that is fairly popular and centering your theme around that. So things like Christmas for December, Halloween for October, Valentine's, St. Patrick's Day, all of those kind of things. If these are holidays that you enjoy celebrating, you could also bring that celebration into your bullet journal. An idea that is similar but a little different though is that of novel holidays, and this is the one that I quite enjoy. There are so many different days or months or weeks of recognition, and you could go through each of the months of the year and pick out the ones that you like. For instance, Odd Socks Day for November, or Talk Like a Pirate Day with a pirate's theme in September. I would love to see somebody do a Moscow Mule Day in March, that one would be a lot of fun, and I'd also be kind of curious in goat yoga. Not to do it though, I'm not good at yoga. <laughs> of course that was just 12 ideas, so if you want a bunch more, here we have some on the screen. Each of these could be turned into a year-long theme. Pokemon is one that you may have seen before, so different type of Pokemon or different Pokemon in general for each of the months. You could have a theme around different mythical creatures or different biomes or different TV shows, movies or books that you enjoy. You could do something like a fandom deep dive, so taking a media that you're particularly passionate about and looking at different aspects of that for each of the months of the year, whether that be different characters or different settings or whatever else. As we said, year-long themes can just be a fun creative challenge, along with just helping you narrow the playing field of themes so that you can pick your theme more easily. But for our next set of ideas, we're stepping away from the aesthetics and thinking about the notebook use more widely. If you're anything like me, then you may have a small addiction to buying new notebooks, but then the trouble comes with what are we actually going to use them for. While they could of course be used as bullet journals at some point, what could be good is to have an additional notebook in your lineup, or what I call a companion notebook. These are notebooks that you have in addition to your bullet journal, so holding a particular subset of information, and I've got 12 ideas for these that you could add to your journaling lineup. If you're looking for another notebook to accompany your bullet journal, then I have 12 ideas for you, and our first one is that of a yearly collections journal. This one is for any of the collections that span a full year. In particular, collections that span a full year that I don't want to have to set up multiple times. So as you can see, this one was for 2022, so it contained layouts that were going to last the entire of 2022, but I only wanted to set up once. In 2022, I had three everyday bullet journals, and I didn't want to set up a word of the year page in every single one of them. I didn't want to set up a goal overview page in every single one of them. Goal action plans, yes, but not the overview. I didn't want to have to rewrite my 101 things list three times, because that's a lot of writing, because 101 things is a lot of things. Having a yearly collections journal, where I can keep all of those collections and just set them up once, is much more useful. So it's a place to just refer back to for all of those collections that are going to last the full year. Like my 2222s in 2022, or my weight tracker, or my yearly collection here for not eating fast food. We'll just ignore the fact that the challenge was not done well, <laughs> so on and so forth. Our next idea is that of a long-term collections journal, which sounds similar to the yearly collections journal, but I promise you is different. While the yearly collections journal is for yearly collections, the long-term collections journal, unsurprisingly, is for things that are a bit more long-term. So initially this was just for layouts that were going to last longer than the lifespan of one journal, which for me previously was six months. But you can see I've got a little blurb here that talks about whether a collection actually belongs here. I've then got an index because this one isn't necessarily chronological, so that can be helpful. But this is for collections that I could in theory set up in my everyday bullet journal, 
but again, I don't want to have to transfer them every single time I make a new one, and I don't want to have to try and come looking for it if I keep it in those old journals. Having it all in one place makes it much easier. So things like Bujo themes that I want to do, like monthly journal themes, my perpetual calendar kind of thing, so birthdays that I value, holidays that I celebrate or want to celebrate. We've got my apocalypse because this is my bucket list for life. I don't want to set that up in every new bullet journal. I've also got pages related to reference material. So things like what can I include in a monthly bullet journal setup? What could I include on a weekly log? We've got some different pages related to media consumption. We've got things like my things to do in list. So things to do in five minutes, things to do in 10, another reference type page. Having them all in here just makes it a little easier. I know where to go to reference this stuff and I don't have to flip back through all of my previous journals, of which there are quite a few. Another type of reference material that I keep in here are swatch pages, because again, I don't wanna have to re-swatch all of my pens with every new journal. So having them in here just makes it easier. So these ones are all just swatched out in the back of this journal so that they're nice and easy to reference. And I just have this one-stop shop effectively for all of my pens. Another journal that you might be interested in having as a companion is that of a five-year journal. This one is set up so I have a little bit of space for each of the days of the year for five years in a row. So January 5th for 2023, 2024, 25, 26, 27. In this little bit of space, I can write down things like daily happenings, memories, any wins that I had, challenges that I experienced, effectively anything that I want to. The nice part about having set it up myself is that it is very flexible. I've also color coded each of the months, so January is pink. If we flip forward to February, you can see that one is red. Then if we go forward again to March, that one's kind of like a light red salmon-y kind of color. We then have April, which I've done in a kind of light orange. This one would be very much an everyday check-in kind of thing because you're writing something down for every day, but the space is small, you're only writing a little bit. So because that filling in is simple, it shouldn't take too long to fill in each day. A type of companion journal that is very popular at the moment is that of a reading journal or a media journal. I super love reading journal content, I always think that they are so gorgeous, but the kind of things that you could put into a reading or media journal could be reading or media consumption challenges, or you could put trackers or things like that. These ones are all ideas from my reading challenge idea video, which is linked in the description box along with any of the other videos that are related to this one. These can just make for nice kind of memory keeping journals about the different media, or books in this case, that you're consuming. Another common type of companion notebook that people have alongside their bullet journal is that of a goal planner. Some people do prefer to just have their goal planning inside their bullet journal, but there can also be value in having your goals separate so that you can get really deep and specific and focused with them. The kind of things you put in there, completely up to you, as per always these are just ideas, but some things that I had in my one were stuff like a space for goal setting tips, not that I quite filled it in, a space for the SVEM and the SMART goal setting processes, depending on the type of goal, might fit better with one versus the other, a little section on habit making and habit breaking, so you can have all of this kind of like pre-goal setting information or kind of reference materials, but then you can also have your goal planning, goal setting, that kind of stuff. So brainstorming for what you want your goals to be, thinking about the stuff that you kind of value or what really fires or lights you up, thinking about the anti-vision of you, so what kind of stuff would make you your unhappiest person and how can we avoid that happening? I find that doing this kind of brainstorming deep dive stuff before setting my goals to be very helpful to actually identify what it is I want to work on. So stuff like the level 10 life to just check in with my different areas of life, make sure that I'm tracking in the right direction in terms of my happiness with those, and then getting into the actual goal setting. You can see I've also included a space for milestones because it's good to have a place to note down the good stuff that's happening. We need to celebrate progress even if the progress is small because small progress is still progress. Once you've set your goals though, we then also need places to write out what we're gonna do in order to achieve them. So like action plan kind of stuff. If you wanna focus more on your self care or your health, then having a journal dedicated to that could be useful too. 
depending on what kind of self-care or what type of health you want to look at, then the structure of your notebook might be a little different. These kind of ideas are related to mental health or mental wellness. So thinking about the zone of control, things you can and can't control. Thinking about when something goes wrong, what can you do about it? So it's like, if I'm feeling lonely, what could I do to mitigate or alleviate that feeling? Mood boosters, you could have things like a de-stressing idealist. So things that you can do right now or things that you can do for future you so that future you isn't stressed. My personal self-care journal is this little guy here. So just a very small pocket size kind of journal that I can fill with journaling, but also do things like just sticker collages because I find them really relaxing. So just kind of unrestricted creativity, which sometimes ends up looking messy, but is still a lot of fun. If fostering your creativity is important to you, in particular anything related to painting or drawing, that kind of stuff, then another idea is having a sketchbook. This notebook in particular has blank pages, so it was pretty good for having as a sketchbook, but I haven't used very much of it, if I'm honest. What I like to do when I sketch anything out though is write down when I sketched it out, just so that then as I progress through the sketchbook, I can kind of see my progress relating to different styles. As mentioned though, didn't get very far with it, but it might work better for you. A type of companion notebook that I very much value is that of my R&D Bujo, or Research and Development Journal. While I mainly use mine as a space to make sample layouts for my idea videos, what you could of course use an R&D Bujo for is actually trialing out layouts. So as a place to mock up or sketch out a layout and see if you like it or if it's actually going to work before you put it in your actual journal. I don't know about you, but I can sometimes get kind of particular about how my bullet journal looks, so having a notebook for just messy notes can be really useful too. Sometimes you just want to take a note down quickly, or you just want to take down some kind of scribbly notes or scribbly lettering practice, so having a go-to book to put all of that information in could be useful. This means that that stuff doesn't get lost, you still have a one-stop shop for all of those scribbly notes but you don't have to put them in your actual bullet journal and, I don't know, compromise your aesthetics. It's okay to want things to look nice. I totally get it. So, messy notes, totally for it. A companion notebook that's a little bit more for fun than for function, you could have a memory keeping journal. These can take a lot of different forms. This one in particular was made for me by my grandmother before she passed away. So she decided to kind of use stickers and stick in photos of her and my grandfather when they were younger and through up until they were teenagers and when they got married and stuff. So it just makes her a really cute keepsake. Like they made this for me, you know, intentionally picked things out, stuck them in. And it's just really sweet, honestly. You could make something similar to this to pass on to, I don't know, future generations or whoever you want, really. I do encourage you to be mindful of what you're making it in and what materials you're using, because we want anything that you put in this type of journal to last as long as possible. So if you're sticking photos in, making sure you're using acid-free tape so that the pictures don't deteriorate over time, that kind of stuff. But it could be a really cute keepsake to pass on. Another memory keeping type book you could have is that of a travel journal. And as can be expected, this is a place to document notes from your travels. I did used to keep a travel journal, so I'd set up a new section for each of the different trips we took. So this trip was back in 2017, we went to Napier. So I had a space to write down the details of the trip. So when, where, who, that kind of stuff, where we were going, had a blank space here, not too sure what the intention was, a space that summarized the funny moments, a space to write down all of my travel diary notes, and this in particular is where the kind of memory keeping gets into it. I did mainly just journal stuff out, have a little sticker from one of the eateries we went to, but you could also stick in photos, other memorabilia, that kind of stuff. Another idea is dedicating a notebook to being a commonplace book. Commonplace books are according to Wikipedia, a way to compile knowledge, usually by writing information into books. Unsurprisingly, because it's called a commonplace book. Effectively, it's just a space to write down any kind of thoughts, feelings, notes, reading notes in particular, which is what I've got here. People use it to write things down like proverbs, quotes, speeches. Essentially, it's a book of ideas. 
Personally, I have nine journals on the go at the moment, and while that might seem a little bit excessive, I don't actually use every single one of them every day. I of course use my everyday journal every day, but other ones only get used once in a while, maybe once a week, possibly even once a month depending on which one they are. I've also got some that are just for reference, so they really get used when they need to be used. Not every day at all. Hopefully this was enough ideas for you, but if it wasn't and you're still on the hunt for more, I do have a playlist of all of my bullet journal ideas that would be worth checking out, along with all of the videos that I mentioned in this one which are linked in the description. Click or tap on any of those and I'll see you over there.